All right, good morning, everyone. This is the fourth day of uh, SPLV, and today we are starting with the second lecture from Ohad Kamar on uh, statistical modeling semantics with high order measure theory. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's Thursday after a very long week, so thanks for coming at 9 a.m. So I thought maybe I'll start with a little recap uh, of what we discussed yesterday and following yesterday's lecture. Um, so we wanted to define uh, probability distributions over more and more spaces, and we want to do it uh, in a way that scales up uh, and might even be computer interpretable. Okay, so so uh, the simple spaces, the very really simple ones, right, are finite spaces. Uh, uh, they have <coughs> a finite set of points. So one of the simplest one, right, is we have uh, uh, the outcomes of a coin flip, heads or tail. Uh, uh, the events we can have is either the the um, the coin flipped head or flipped tail, right? Uh, these are two different events, or we can say the event where either of them happened, we don't really distinguish between them, or the event where the coin never flipped at all, uh, um, and we want to assign probability to them, okay? So in this very simple case, we can just assign to uh, the head the bias of the coin. In this case, this is a coin that's biased towards head, three quarters, uh, and we assign the, the tail the probability of a quarter, uh, and of course, from this, we can derive the the coin will always flip head or tail. It's never going to stay up in the air. So we take it stuck, uh, and the outcome of getting any result is one. Okay, this is defining probabilities. As the spaces get more complicated, for example, we flip the coin three times, <coughs> right? We get more complicated events. Okay, for example, we had more heads than tails. Okay, so we start to talk about subsets of the points in the space. Okay, each point is the outcome of every flip, of every three flips, uh, uh, and the events are. Um, um, subsets of those of those events, and then we can still carry on this very simple model of, of probability, where we just assign some uh, uh, number to each point, and, and, and if, if you want to calculate the, the probability that it has happened, you just sum up those points. Okay, so far so good. Good. Okay, now you move on to uh, uh, countable discrete spaces. So this time uh, uh, we can have an infinitely many points. For example, we, we decide to flip the coin some number of times and then we look uh, 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 at how many, uh, at the outcomes. Okay, and so embodied in, in, in the notion of probability on this space is the probability of how many times we flip the coin. Okay, uh, uh, so, so now the event more heads than tail gets a bit more complicated because it depends on how many times we decide to flip it. Right. And then it depends on, we need to decide how many times we got head. It has to be more than half. Okay. And then we need to decide where, which one of the outcomes uh, was heads. So we need to kind of find an injection. So there's some combinatorics happening here. That's why when you're doing a lot of finite or discrete probability, it's a lot of combinatorics trying to count things. <coughs> okay. So, so once we decide what the positions are, then we look at the outcome uh, in which we put heads in the positions that we decide is going to be a head. Okay, now in order to color, we have to, to, to assign a probability, for example, uh, uh, identically distributed biases for the conflicts, but also there's another probability factor here, which is how many times have we decide to flip it. Okay, and you need to sum up all of these things. The sums get more complicated, they get infinite. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so as you move to uh, 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 from discrete countable, a uh, discrete finite to discrete countable, things get more complicated. And when you move to continuous spaces, things get even more complicated. But also some coincidences that we had in the discrete case start, start to look different now. Okay, so, so let's let's just recap that. Uh, so moving to the continuous space, the easiest one is the real numbers. For example, we choose a normally distributed real number, uh, 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 or you can choose a uniform distributed real number on the interval zero one. <coughs> And now the events, uh, each specific number has zero probability to appear, right? If you, if you look at a single point uh, under a uniform distribution or a normal distribution, the probability will be zero, okay? So, uh, and as we said yesterday, that you can't measure all possible uh, subsets of reals, so we have to restrict to a, a subset of, uh, of the reals, and we're gonna take the Borel subsets here. Okay, now probabilities get more complicated because I can uh, integrate some terms, I can, I can add sums, uh, so this specific probability puts some uh, uh, a normal distribution on the real line. Uh, 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 so I'm integrating on this subset, okay? 
uh, uh, but it also puts some probability on specific points on the real lines, the even number points. Okay, so it gets complicated. It's not just integrals, it's not just sums, it's integrals and sums. Okay, and you want a generalization that, that, that uh, uh, um, um, generalizes both. And you can't just think of assigning numbers to each to each point. That's what's called a density. You have to have some kind of ambient measure. Some kind of measure with respect, you have a density. And in this specific case, you have some kind of combination of the big measure and the Dirac measure. So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to highlight, if you want to take something away from this, things get more complicated. And you really want a theory where you can make sense of all this uniformly. Otherwise, you just have to, you know, you're going to split into cases every time you try to understand your system. Yes? With that theory, will that give you the sums for free so you don't have to do calculations in this complicated way? You're going to have a uniform way of doing sums, yes. And, and when you look at a continuous distribution, it's going to be integrals. I mean, you're looking at uh, discrete ones, it's going to be sums, but it's going to be the same operator. It's going to be called the Lebesgue integral. Okay? Thanks. But, but, but it's more, as the cases get more complicated, there'll be a theory of how to put those sums together. Fantastic. Yeah, we're going to have a few of putting the spaces together. We're going to have a few of putting probabilities and, and measures on top of those spaces together. And we're going to have a few of them trying to integrate them, uh, um, which will give you a, a specification of what you can do about it. And then you're going to have to prove that this integral is equal to something or another, or try to estimate it using numerical methods or simulation and all kinds of other things. Okay. Any questions so far? This is about the context, right? which we discussed a bit yesterday, but maybe it's a bit more, more crisp now. Okay, and um, and if you want to look at a space that looks discrete, but is actually continuous, let's look at a coin and all of its, all of its uh, uh, um, outcomes during its lifetime. So that's a countable number of flips for the coin. Okay, and that's actually a continuous space because it's it's kind of it branches as many times, but it can go on forever. And so at, at the edges you get a continuum of, of outcomes. Okay, this is an uncountable set of points. So it is actually a continuum. Okay, it's not necessarily continuous in the traditional sense, but it's a continuum. Then you have to do something different, right? It's no longer the Lebesgue measure; it's called, it's called the Haar measure, uh, 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 and, and there's all kinds of more complex spaces you can you can use to do it. But it's still the same technology. Okay, they're finding uh, uh, spaces of points, the measurable events, measures on them, okay, and trying to measure various events. Great. And as we said yesterday, if you go down the route of measure theory, there are some constructions that you, you can't get, for example, uh, uh, getting a function space. And as Sam pointed out yesterday, function spaces are extremely useful for modular uh, uh, development of, of, of programs, but they can also be useful for modular development of models. Okay. In particular, something we've seen yesterday is uh, once you have function spaces, uh, uh, even if you don't have all of them, uh, you can construct lambda terms, then you can tell that something is measurable. So that means you can integrate it okay, uh, uh, just by looking at the term. You don't have to check anything because as a term, the term is typed, is well typed, uh, uh, measurability is guaranteed, nothing to check, which is very nice. Okay, and, and we kind of split into this alternative universe where we're looking at quasi broad spaces that do have function spaces. And what we're going to do is we, we're going to reconstruct a, a whole bunch of meta theory, measure theory in this new universe. Okay, but this time we'll take full advantage of the function spaces. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so yesterday we talked about the Borel sets, we talked about quasi broad spaces, and we only talked about the definition. And, and as I said, the, the slogan is measurability by type. Today, we're going to talk about constructions of uh, um, um, taking different spaces, putting them together, and notions to do with partiality and uh, type structures, which is how we can construct things more syntactically. Okay, so, so you you have various, various compositional ways of putting programs together. We can recast them as compositional ways of putting spaces together. And I'll show you what they look like uh, inside this universe. And hopefully, well, we'll see. We might get to measure the integration, hopefully. Uh, if not, there's videos uh, uh, on the on the course webpage where you can find the exercises. Uh, uh, and if you're interested in the further topic, topics, see, see the lectures all the way to when you see, learn about random variable spaces and the and commodores condition expectation. I don't think we're going to get that today. So and there's, there's no need. Okay. So what was a quasi world space, if you remember? We had two things, a set of points and a collection of random elements. And the random elements are measurable ways in which we can equip or push a probability onto the space, spread some continuous probability on the space. Okay, and they were closed on the three axioms, 
constants, constant elements or, or deterministic elements, putting all the probability on one point is a measurable operation. It's a random element. If I had one of those random elements and I have a measurable way of rearranging the probability, then the precomposition is a random element. And recombination, if I have a countable case set of the reals <coughs> into a countable collection of these joint real sets, and for each of them I have a random element, putting them together using a countable case set is also a random element. Okay, this all looks familiar to everyone. Does anyone want me to zoom in on one of those axioms? Yes. I have an interest on the diagram for recombination. Why is it not? I would be expecting to be union of the two so green areas, but you're up the top of the fantastic. So the left one puts all the probability on the left part of the space, and the right one puts all the probability on the right part of the space. But what I'm doing now is I'm chopping the reels into two parts, and now I need to know which part of the reels moves on to the top part or the bottom part. And that's what's happening at the bottom. So, so uh, uh, the left one goes to the top part and the right one goes to the bottom part. And so if I'm only keeping the right part on the blue, then it goes to the left part. Make sense? To the bottom part. Sorry. Thanks. So I don't know if you have the slide for the actual formal definition we gave yesterday, mm -hmm. but it looks as though following on from Matthew's question, that you're sort of rescaling the blue bit and the green bit. No, so so the blue bit gets mapped on the left half. And that means you well, I understand that comes from the partition, but so, no, you, you see, there's no partition here. All of the blue part goes on, on, on the whole of the left part. It, it's not being partitioned. Yeah. So I'm throwing away the left part of the blue, which goes onto the top part of the donor. Yep. Yep. Yes. Fantastic. And the, and the scaling is actually the precomposition, but you can stretch the measurement. So, so I know that some people have geometric intuition. These pictures are useful for them. Some people have the algebraic definition. So, so uh, um, we can go there as well and look at the uh, algebraic definition. These are just different ways of looking at the same mathematical gadget. I'm just trying to give you both options depending on which ones you spread. Okay. Great. So these were the axioms. And then we looked at uh, uh, three kinds of examples. So the, the full example of interest, the real numbers. Okay, and, and, and the points are the real numbers as points, and then the random elements are all the measurable functions from the reals to the reals. Okay, so that's our example of interest. <clears throat> and if I have a set X, there's two different ways in, in which I can equip it with a quasi real space structure. One of them is by taking uh, uh, this, only the sigma simple function. So these are the uh, um, step functions, or, or, or I, I um, divide the reals into a countable position. <laughs> Of Boyle sets, and each one of them has like a constant value. So, countable recombinations of constants. Okay, each one of them has to be a random element because of the, of the axioms. Uh, and if you only take them, then that's a quasi Boyle space structure. And the other one is the kind of the other extreme uh, you're throwing all the functions. Okay, and we call the first one the discrete one, the second one the English one. So, this gives you three different phase structures on real time. Right? Exactly. And they're all different. There's an exercise for, for doing that. Okay. If you see a recurring thing, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff in the exercises to explore these materials. So I strongly encourage you to follow up on them and, and come and ask me if, if it's too much or not enough or if you're more interested or less interested or something you're not clear. Thanks. Okay. So now let's continue. So this was yesterday. Okay. And, and just like a one, one second for people who like to organize the world categorically, what's happening with the discrete and the indiscrete construction is that we have a, a, a two adjunctions going between the category of sets and the quasi of quasi world spaces. Okay. And if you, even if you don't know any category theory, the exercise sheets explore that a, a bit more. So I'm trying to familiarize you with more category theory, but it's, a big veto. So, so that's why I'm only speaking to people who already know this in the room, but we'll go back to basic in the next slide. Okay, so if I have a quasi world space structure, I can take a set of points that gives me a functor. It has two, uh, two adjoints left and right. The left one gives me the discrete one, the right one gives me the indiscrete one. And in fact, this factorizes through the constructions of uh, um, the uh, discrete measurable space structure. So if I want to get the discrete uh, measurable stru space structure, 
of a set, I can first create a quasi world space structure and then create another junction. So what I'm saying here, there's another junction <clears throat> that goes from measurable spaces to quasi world spaces that takes the random element as the measurable functions. And this one has a left adjoint that gives you the uh, all the Borel sets. I mean, we'll look at that in a, in a minute. Okay. And, and now, if you even if you don't know any category, what well, that means, okay, to come back, uh, uh, it means that uh, 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 the limits and the colimits, all the products and the co-products of putting space together, they're all calculated in quasi world spaces just as well as they're calculated in sets. Okay, so the product of two spaces, the points is are just sequences of points. So the Cartesian product of points. Yes. Apologies again for the question from the experts. Is this one way of understanding why Leeds is a bad category? Because that mechanical function does has a large aggregate. Um and so and so there isn't as nice structure inside the top as there is in the I don't know, but this this process that QBX is, is has has to be a nice well, you promised us that it does. So. I, I think, but 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 I don't want to make kind of value judgments on, on mesh, right? It's just a different kind of universe, okay? And the way it relates to quasi world space is in this way, but not in the other one. I'll take value judgment just say that because is that one of the reasons why it has less desirable. That's still the value judgment. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, James. Any other questions, actually? Okay. Okay. Let's go back to let's go back to reality. Now, whatever, you know, back to more elementary. Okay. So uh, one of the main constructions we want to take, for example, we looked at it in the beginning of the talk, is the product of spaces, right? So if I earlier I had heads and tails, I will take heads and tails three times. Okay. The the triple product, right? So one time uh, booleans, then booleans, then booleans. <clears throat> so how do I do it? So if I have two spaces, what's the product I need to take uh, to define a space that is the product space, and then two projections, uh, uh, one from the space into X and the other one into Y. So, so what are the points in the product? Uh, they are just, just, uh, and also there's an exercise in the in the notes about just. So you can go and have a look at that. So, so the, it's just a collection of points of, of of pairs, one from each space. And what are the random elements? That might be the surprising thing. These are all the functions that uh, uh, on the first component act like one random element and on the second component act like another one. Okay, and if you think about uh, uh, the source, the real, your, your source of randomness or a sample space, what this means is that you have two random elements that are correlated. They kind of move together. So if you only look at one of them in isolation, it might look completely random, but if you look at both of them together, they behave in a correlated way. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, and the projections are just the projection from set. And that was the point in, of the previous slide. That's an easy way of getting why it is just the familiar projections you used to from the Cartesian products of, of when you're working with sets or more concrete spaces. Um, all, all it means is that the, both components know about the same R. Right. So, so you see that they kind of de they depend on the R in a correlated way together. But it's just an intuition. I mean, the formal definition is is here. Uh, the random element in the product is a pair of random elements. Any other questions? Okay. So that's simple. Simple is good, right? You want the sophistication to come into your models, not into your meta language. Um, so now let's do function spaces. Okay. Uh, uh, so what's a, what's a function spaces? Uh, if I have two spaces, y and x, and we'll look at all the functions from x to y, well, the points are going to be now quasi world space morphisms from x to y. Okay, so it is a space of function. It is the space of functions. And what are the random elements? Well, these are going to be functions from the reals into the space of functions. So if you uncarry, if you uh, uncarry it, what you get is a, a, a two argument function. Okay, <clears throat> uh, the first argument is the real number, the second <laughs> argument is X, and, and what we ask for them is that they're going to be a quasi world space morphism. Okay, so the random elements are the carrying of two arguments from uh, quasi world space morphisms. Okay, so that's really straightforward, uh, and that's also a good thing. 
Okay, so what's not clear exactly from this is why this satisfies the quasi growth space axioms, and that's also an exercise in, in the notes. And it's a bit more structured than just doing it blindly because recombination can be a bit more tricky. Yes, all the quasi growth space morphisms from x to y. So if you remember, a quasi growth space morphism is a function that sends points to points, uh, and if you precompose it with a random element in the source, you get a random element in the target. Okay. An evaluation is the set theoretic evaluation. Okay, so given a morphism f and a point x, apply f to x. And that's that satisfies all the properties you want of an evaluation function and all a function space. Okay, so it's straightforward, and that's a feature, right? That's good. Okay, because that means it's simple. Okay, it's what you'd expect. Any questions so far? Any more questions? I'm loving all the interaction. Yes, you're done. Sorry, say that again. Here. Um, so here it's yes. Yeah, so so here it's just a it's the set of real numbers, and here it's the quasi world space of real numbers, and this is the product that we've seen in the previous slide. Yeah. So it is bringing more structure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but for the wheels, I'm kind of ambiguous about it because there's only ever one structure you really want about the wheels at every given point. And if it's different, then I would use a different notation to, to highlight that. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Why is it necessary to change morphism to quasi or space at the other eigen space and not just function? All functions from X to Y. So if 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 you take arbitrary functions from x to y, because of evaluation, you can recover that function as a morphism of quasi world spaces. So if you had a function that's not a morphism of quasi world spaces, then suddenly you, you get it as a morphism of quasi world spaces. That can't happen. Or put it differently, the elements here from the elements here you can recover the morphism as a morphism of quasi world spaces. So it better be a morphism of quasi world spaces to begin with. Make sense? We can even uh, maybe write it. So if I have some f in y to the x in the carrier at that point, then I can write the term lambda x fx going from x to y. That's a morphism of quasi world spaces. Okay, and you have to do some proof for that, but uh, it would show that uh, uh, this represents a function, and that function is a morphism of quasi world spaces. So all the elements in this represent morphism of quasi world spaces. They don't represent arbitrary functions between x and y. So it's possible for cardinality reason you could encode all possible functions because of some restrictions, but but you'll be destroying the applic applicative structure there. Okay, so application is not going to behave in the same way. It's not going to behave. On the, the codes of quasi world space morphism that they represent. Okay. Any more questions? We can also continue to talk about this offline in, in, in the tutorial or in the break. Okay, great. So this is surprisingly uneventful, this construction. Again, that's a good thing. Yes. So are you saying that? Uh, you have to fit x and y, and no matter what you fit, random variable, uh, whatever you call it, is in x and y. I don't, I don't, can you? The, so, I don't get why uh, when you decompose the model, any function with the random element, you still get a random element. But that, that's the definition of what a morphism is. So, so in the same way that when you were talking about. Function is a that's not no, let's 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 go back. Uh, in the, in the, when you were writing on the so do you remember this? Let's let's re remember this slide. Okay, a morphism between two spaces, a, so a measurable function, okay, <laughs> is a function such that if you precompose a random element, a random element, you get a random element. Can you open the stack yes, of course. So what did you say? You said any function has. Sorry. You said any function has. So any element of the function space 
represents a, 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 a quasi world space morphism. But does that mean that so, so, so what, what I what I told Martin is that if the element represents a function, it represents a quasi world space morphism, not arbitrary function from x to y. So, for example, uh, 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 if we, if we well, okay, we'll see some more concrete examples in a few seconds. Yeah. So in the slide that you were on earlier, where I have your eval function. Yep. Uh, so does that one function belong to a quasi world space? Yes, that's exactly correct. So there's a corresponding one. This uh, is the point. This is the point. Ex exactly. Okay. So I also have eval uh, uh, that's in uh, uh, y to uh, y to the x times x. And all this is in the exponent. Yeah, you can just move freely between the elements of the function space and morphisms. <clears throat> okay. More questions. This is fantastic. Okay. Let's go up. To the categorical level, just just one more bit, because this might also answer James's question uh, from earlier on. By ver by generalities, because I have an evaluation function going from reals to the reals times reals to the reals, okay, then I have a measurable function going from the measurable space over this space to that space. Okay, so that looks like. Uh, uh, um, you know, contradiction to Arman's theorem, right? That we, we can actually define a measurable evaluation function. But James's point is that the products in quasi world spaces, once you translate it up to measurable spaces according to this free measurable space construction, does not get preserved. Okay, so even though I do have this map here, there is no way to add another map here that makes this commute. <laughs> so that's another kind of way of seeing it. Okay, but but again, if if you if this is not the language you're talking about, it's not going to tell you anything. It's just really just for the few people in the room who already know this. So let's go back to basics. Okay, and, and so one of the things we can do is we can now internalize what it means to be a random element. So so and that I think might relate to your question. So if I have any any quasi world space X, I can look at the function space from R to X of X to the R. Okay. And uh, it turns out that the points in that space are the random elements. Okay, and there's an exercise that you can look at the slide. If you want. shall we go through the, this argument uh, uh, here, or do you want to do it offline? Uh, James, you're in charge of doing proofs or not? I'm not in charge. Not in charge. But I think this might give insight. Okay, so we'll we'll go with that. Okay, everyone. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're going to show, we're going to show that the points in the function space x to the r are exactly the random elements as sets. So if we take an element in uh, uh, um, x to the r, so now that means that alpha is a quasi world space morphism from r to x. Okay, so that means it sends a random element over the reals into a random element in x. In particular, the identity function is a measurable function from the reals to the reals. So it's a random element in the reals. Okay, therefore, I can compose alpha with the identity and by the precomposition axiom, that's a random element, but that's also alpha. So alpha is a random element. Okay, so, the, so all the elements in X to the R are random elements. Okay, and if we go the other way around, so you take a random element, well, then, for every measurable function, uh, uh, um, so for every element, so take an arbitrary random element over the reals, that's a measurable function from the real to the reals. Okay. And therefore, a, a alpha precomposed with phi gives you a random element because you start with a random element. That was the precomposition axiom. Okay. And therefore, you get something in, in the random elements over X. Okay. So just to kind of recap, uh, if alpha was a random element, uh, uh, um, um, 
if alpha was a random element in X, uh, 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 sorry, if phi was a random element in X, uh, pre-composing it with uh, 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 Alpha is the random element, it's pre-composed to the measurable. Uh, thanks, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you get a random element, fantastic. And that's why you get a quasi borel space morphism, therefore, an, a random, a, a, an element in X to the R. So that's the reverse inclusion. And that's, so, sorry for making it up. I get, all your intelligence gets sucked in front of the, in front of the, uh, the board here. So, so uh, uh, um, thanks to this, we've proved this now, this equality. Okay, what it means is that we have a canonical quasi world space structure on random elements. So if we talk, think about random elements, they're not just points, they have a quasi world space structure given by the function space. So we have a space of random elements. So you can internalize what it means to be a random element. That's nice. Yes? Could we say that that is the reason to have quasi world space multiples as in this space and not just up space? Up until now, I didn't see any link between uh, elements from the spaces and random elements in making them interact. But this is the first time, and this is a property we would like to have that uh, functions from R to X are exactly the random elements. But this is when we need properties on the function space to make this double inclusion true. So it's quite difficult to separate causation here, right? Because yeah. uh, 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 the, you, know, you can have a very general reason of why the element of the function space are going to be functions, and that's because uh, things are determined by uh, global elements and so on. So, so that's that's like a that's why you'd get that, uh, not not because of any special definition on quasi world space morphisms or anything like that. It's more to do with the fact that uh, uh, the morphisms. Uh, uh, in that universe are functions, okay? but the actual axioms of them are, are not not necessarily what's causing that. So one thing that might help is this construction of function space is not particularly, you know, special for quasi borel spaces. It's it's very general. It's what you want. It's, it's what you are very happy if you can get with any sort of spaces that are set equipped with extra structures and morphisms that somehow preserve. But, thanks. If, if, if it helps but may, maybe something that might help is because of this fact, okay, that's why we forced to take the random elements on the function space to be this. Because the, uh, 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 because by kind of just covering things around, you realize that they have to be the quasi borel space morphisms from R times X to Y. Okay, so there's no other choice. But we know there's no other choice once we know that as a function space because there's a categorical property of it. What it should be. Okay, sorry, that was a bit. So, so, so there's more. There's more exercise in investigating this as well. This specific, as well. and, and it's really your neda in disguise, actually, if, if you know where things are coming from. But if you don't know what your neda is, then ignore ignore this position. Okay, go go back back to basics again. <clears throat> okay, so that was one construction. We have two spaces. We can take the function space. Okay, let's look at another construction because I promise you some constructions on on uh, quasi world spaces. So if I have a quasi world space X and I have a subset of it A, okay, uh, um, then I can equip the subset with the quasi world space structure by taking well what's missing random elements. So which random elements are we going to take? All the random elements in the big space in the super space that are actually inside A. Okay, so so they take only take values in A. Okay, they never leave A. Okay, and that's what we that's how I'm going to call a, a, a subspace. And if you know, whereas Yogi, it's not the same thing as a subobject. It's different. Okay, so so and there's exercises to explore that as well. Okay, all, all the possible connections. There's a whole sheet on subspaces. Okay. Any questions? Maybe. Okay, so for example, if you look at uh, the unit interval from zero to one. That has a natural quasi world space structure by taking it as the subspace of the rings. Okay, so uh, uh, but any subset of the rings you can view it as a, as a uh, quasi world space structure by equipping uh, 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 it with a structure. But some of them would be uh, uh, nicer than others, and this will be the Borel subspaces. Okay, so <clears throat> so what's the Borel subs? So what are the, what is the Borel subset 
of a quasi world space X. So what's the measurable subset of a quasi world space X? This is a set, a subset of the space, a set of points, such that for every random element, its inverse image is a Borel set. Okay, so if you go back to yesterday, when we talk, talk about measurable functions, uh, it's a set that all the random elements in the space are measurable with respect to it. So it's not gonna, uh, let's, let's say it differently. It's not gonna violate measurability of any random element. Okay, so the random elements can't detect that uh, uh, it shouldn't be a measurable set. It shouldn't be a Borel set. Uh, 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 and that's this definition. Yep, go on. Do you say that the sigma algebra for curiosity or does it matter? It, it is a sigma algebra, yes. Yeah, but does it matter for the theory of the space? I take advantage of it because I have a lot of measure theory lying around, 100 years worth of measure theory. Uh, so, so, so why not? But it also connects. So remember when I said yesterday, I'm, I'm taking full advantage of the connection between quasi world space and measurable space. Okay. So it is a sigma algebra, uh, uh, but the point is that it's not only a sigma algebra, it has a structure of a quasi borel space. And how do I do that? You have to prove a little theorem that says that these subsets are in direct correspondence with uh, morphisms from X to the booleans, one plus one, in a discrete QB quasi borel space of the two elements. Okay, there's a proof, you have, to, you have to do the proof. Okay, and there's an exercise about that. Uh, 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 but because of that, because I, I can identify the elements of uh, uh, of this sigma algebra with the points of a quasi world space, I have a natural way of talking about them as a space. Okay, so I have a space of world sets, something I did not have uh, uh, as a measurable space structure. Okay, so it does have a measurable space structure by taking the free quasi uh, measurable space over it, but it's not going to make membership measurable. That's Almond's theorem. Okay. That's the other part of the theorem. And in fact, if you look at the proof, he, he, that's that's where all the sophistication is. Uh, you can reduce the, the second part to this one. It really is just about membership. And that's enough to make things not measurable. Okay, and you can of course repeat this. So you can look at the Borel sets of the Borel sets, uh, 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 um, and that's called the Borel and Borel sets, uh, uh, and they're well well known from the descriptive set theory and and uh, Sam Staten and Martin Sabok. Dario Stein and Michael. Ah, I should not have listed all the names, but I forgot his name. Uh, Woman. Uh, uh, um, use that to define a slightly more accurate model of name generation by, by taking random numbers. <coughs> okay, so so those uh, they they kind of found a, a neat NBE normal evaluation connection uh, uh, using those world world sets to give a slightly more fully abstract, not fully abstract, slightly more fully abstract model of name generation. So check this paper out, it's super cool. Okay, it's called the Borel, Borel Borel subsets. And, and in a sense, this justify the name, right? These are the Borel sets of the Borel sets. Great. So now that we have a space of Borel sets, we can define what standard Borel spaces are, but for quasi Borel spaces. Okay, remember from yesterday, the standard Borel spaces are the nice space. They are the spaces where probability theory works really well. Okay, so a quasi Borel space S is a standard Borel when there is a Borel subset of the reals to which it's isomorphic. Okay, so that means there's a quasi Borel space morphism going one way and a quasi Borel space morphism going the other way, and the identities, the compositions are identities. Fantastic. So we have the standard Borel space of the quasi Borel spaces, the standard Borel spaces of the measurable spaces, and they're isomorphic to each other, those categories. Yes. Here? Here? Uh, isomorphism. They, they form an isomorphism. <coughs> oh. Sorry. Um, and so the sl one slogan you can take from this, okay, so even if you don't, you don't really follow the adjunctions, the equivalence, the isomorphism, uh, uh, um, quasi world spaces. A conservative extension of standard world spaces. So, if standard world spaces are the place where good probability takes place, if you then do some calculation with spaces that are not standard, we are probably using some function spaces and maybe some dependent types, as we see later, but then we end up back in a in a standard world space that we never needed to have left. But we could have done something uh, already in that universe, but it might have been really, really much more complicated. 
Okay, so they give us shortcuts. Okay. Yes. Do you have an example of uh, uh, what you would have paid with not uh, standard with WordPress as well? Uh, yes, uh, um, uh, reels to the reels, for example. Okay. So let's let's do some examples. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, 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 elaborate, but let's let's focus at the top because the bottom is the proof. Okay. So I can look at now the space of functions from the reels to the reels. Okay. And then I want to take only the functions that are continuous. So I can take the subspace of the continuous functions with respect to the topology of the usual topology of the reels. Okay. That are continuous. So I say topology, you know, calculus one from first year. Right? <laughs> Okay, so that you look look at this space. <clears throat> it's a fine sub quasi world space, a sub fine subspace. So that means evaluation is measurable, all the things you want of a function space. Okay, and that space is well known. It's it's standard world. Okay, but if you were showing that it's standard world by kind of constructing a standard world space, you would then have to prove that application or evaluation is measurable. Here it's for free. All you have to do is exhibit some kind of isomorphism. Right to a Borel subset of the reals or to another standard world space. And I can go through this proof, but maybe it's more elaborate than we need to. I don't know. If it's... Show, show of hands if you want to go through the construction in more detail. Let's see. Three hands. That's not enough. Come to me later. We can go do it in the self study. Okay. But it's the same idea as you, you would use in descriptive set theory, which is you, you can encode the information in this space using the style information in the style world space. Okay, so it's not, I'm not, I've not proved a new result, but just proved it in a new way. Yes. Yes. I, I, I don't know. I need, I need to think about this. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's not clear to me you get all the continuous probabilities uh, uh, on the real. The space of real is going to be as close to, to you than the usual space of real. It's not clear to me that st the, the standard real spaces are going to be right. equivalent. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Any more questions? Okay. Right. <clears throat> so CZO continuous functions is standard real space. Evaluation is measurable, and we get that almost for free. So evaluation just by type checking and the isomorphism, you have to construct an isomorphism. Okay, and it avoids the usual proof, which construct complete separable metrics. Okay, you have to construct a complete separate metric to show that it's a polished space, and then you have to show that some, yeah, it's it's kind of a bit of a headache, and it's you just sidestep it uh, in, in this way. Okay, so and it gets even worse when you want to talk about cat lab functions. If you know about cat, um, who's, who's, I'm going to say it, but you can correct me if you're from in France. Continue uh, uh, cat lab. Uh, à droite, uh, uh, limit à uh, gauche. Yes. Okay, so continuous on the left and it has a limit on the right. So kind of continuous function that can jump. Continuous on the right. On the right. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, anyway, Cadillac. I call Cadillac and I'm, and I'm marking this up because, again, this sucks all my intelligence. So, yeah, but but uh, you can do the same trick there and, and show that the space of Cadillacs is a, is, a, is a subspace of the function space and it's obvious it's, it's true. An isomorphism, a standard world space. And that's something that underlies a theory of Mardigal, stochastic uh, uh, differential calculus. And so on. Okay, so I promised you some constructions on quasi world spaces, and I have. So we've looked at the products, function spaces, uh, subspaces, random element spaces, and Borel sets. In the exercises, you will find some more, you'll find pullbacks, you will find uh, co products, the whole, the whole shebang. Okay, uh, so if you're interested in constructing more and more complicated things, uh, uh, have a look at the exercise sheets. There's a whole sheet about constructions. Okay, so far so good. Oh, I should probably stop now. Quick break. Quick break, yeah.
You in charge. Okay. Let's do the class in 10 minutes. So I have to work for 10 hours. Great. Um, until when do I run? Um, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for coming back. So <clears throat> in the previous part, uh, uh, we sh I've shown you how to put spaces together. Uh, now we're going to do two, two more constructions that are uh, uh, have the same kind of nature. Let's just talk about more more construction of the class spaces. And I think I will not actually get to measures of integration today. That's okay. Because uh, people ask me about uh, uh, how to interpret type structure here. And I think in, in PL verification sounds people care a lot about type structure. If you want to learn more about measures of integration, come and talk to me later or look at the other videos or have a look at the papers. Okay, so partiality. A new kind of subspace, a Borel embedding. So what's a Borel embedding? We can embed a quasi Borel space X, the Borel embedding into a subspace Y. Uh, uh, so what's that? It's a quasi Borel space morphism. So it's an injective function from points of X to the point of Y, uh, um, <coughs> whose image is a Borel subset. And that is strong. So what does strong mean? It's just a technical condition. It means that the random elements in the source are exactly uh, uh, the random elements that factor from the target. Okay, so these three conditions. So, for example, they imply that E is actually a quasi world space morphism. That's just this, this, this uh, implication. Okay, it implies that e, that X is a subspace of Y, but it also implies that X, so the image of X, is a Borel subset of Y. That's the point. It's not just any subset of Y, it's a measurable subset of Y. Okay, so examples uh, 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 one is a Borel embedding into two. Okay, um, and in fact, uh, 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 no, I don't want to say that actually. Okay. So one is a Borel embedding in two, uh, and, and, uh, and a quasi Borel space S is a standard, is standard Borel if and only if uh, uh, there's a Borel embedding of it into the rules. Okay. That's why this notion kind of comes up in one of the standard Borel spaces. <coughs> okay, so uh, again, a, a, a Borel embeds into a space X Borel embedded into Y if uh, it's a Borel subspace of Y. That's really what's happening. Okay, so let's look at some non-examples. Oh, yeah, question. So why, why is this definition of Borel embedding different for say the uh, that it's a, a morphism of Borel space if you have a, a structure of this, like this Borel structure of this. You mean that the inverse image of a no. so X is a, is a so why 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 is it different than saying it's an injective morphism? Uh, it's just a diff different way of breaking all these three things. But yeah, it is a quasi world space morphism that's a strong epi, which means just injection, go the implication going the other way, and uh, the image is Borel. I mean, there's just four different things you need to check, and, and you can put them in, in all possible ways. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so one is the discrete quasi world space on one point, and two is the discrete quasi world space on two points. Great question. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, just to clarify that so, so this is this is um, distinct from any function because there are also injective functions that uh, well, yeah, injective functions next to y such that it's in one or else. Yes. So yeah. Yeah, exercise sheets. There's a whole sheet that's just dealing with some spaces. And uh, actually, maybe I'll show you that. This is not the right way of going there. That's just going to go the right way of getting there. So, where are subspaces? You go there, flip the, the colors, so it's readable. And you have all possible inclusions and they're proper. And that's an exercise and gives you some ideas of why they are like that. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Let's look at some non examples because I think they're instructive. <clears throat> and we're looking at the, so if you look at the Borel sets of the reals, okay. 
the collection of subsets of Boel sets that are not empty. It's a subspace of the Boel sets, but it's not a Boel subset. Okay. And these are all due to uh, yeah, Martin Sabok and Sam Staten and Dario Stein and Michael Woman. Okay. Another one. Uh, uh, um, Pairs, now we take pairs of world subsets. Inclusion is not a world subset. Okay, being topologically open is not a world subset. So, so all the operations that are only operating at this level of sets, this is intuition, it's not a precise statement, are not world subsets. So you can't you can't check that you're in them in a measurable way. You can't check membership here in a measurable way. That's the consequence of not being a world subset. Okay, the membership uh, 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 function for these is not a quasi world space morphism over the world sets. So over the super space. Once you're in that space, that's different because you're already in that space. So it's always true, right? You're always in that in, in that subspace. Great. <clears throat> okay, so that that's uh, uh, so that's some more examples. And what's a partial map now? A partial map from X to Y. It's now a quasi world space morphism from X into Y plus one. So that's the usual partiality monad. There's, there's nothing sophisticated happening here. So if you use the partiality in functional programming, it's, it's that. Okay. Uh, but what follows <clears throat> is that the domain of the, 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 the domain of the of definition is a Borel subset uh, uh, of X. It just follows. You have, you have to prove it, but it just follows from this. Okay, and you can define some order uh, on partial functions, which is the usual kind of Scott order. And something is a, a, more, a partial function is bigger than another partial function if it's more defined. Okay, for every x, uh, if the first one is defined on x and the second one is defined on x, and they're equal. That's, that's all I'm going to talk about in, in functions, but, yes, but of course, because a, a partial function is going from x to y plus one. Y plus the the bottom element, uh, um, then you can internalize it and talk talk about the function space y plus one to the x, and now you can talk about partial functions as a space and distribute all of this. We can talk about a random partial function, for example, once you define measures. Everything internalizes. Okay, so that's partial functions. Now let's look at types. Okay. <clears throat> So let's start with simple types. And in fact, there's nothing to do with simple types because I've already done all the hard work. Okay. Uh, uh, if we say simple types den uh, denote spaces, then I've shown you what the products are, I've shown you what the exponentials are, I've shown you what the Borel sets are. So we have a simple type of Borel uh, 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 subsets. Okay. Uh, uh, I didn't show you uh, um, co products, some types. It, that's in the exercise, but it's also that you basically put the points in, next to each other. Uh, it's, it's not actually doing anything complicated. So what actually we're going to talk about more is about the dependent type structure. Okay, but like everything, dependent types make everything complicated. Okay, so uh, so you have to talk about not just uh, uh, spaces, but spaces in context. You have to always think about the context. Okay, so <clears throat> what is this judgment that A is typed in context gamma? It's going to be Two spaces and a morphism. Okay, we have the space that the context represents. Okay, we have the space that the type represents, and we have a morphism that tells us the environment of every of every point in the context. Okay. Uh, the Borel sets. Oh yeah, there's a curly B. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The two bits before are just a uh, um, yes, a world. Yeah, I'm sorry that my 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 calligraphic I I'll, I'll fix that. I'll make it more calligraphic. Thanks. Yes. So, could you elaborate more on the intuition to define spaces in context? Like, it, it's it's a very it's a standard way to interpret dependent types. Uh, it's 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 the uh, local Cartesian closed. So sorry for talking over the head of some people. I think that answers your question, right? Yeah, okay. We'll see what that means in, in, in concretely. Okay, so uh, dependent types denote spaces in context. Okay, so uh, we have uh, a well formed context, which means that all dependencies are well formed, and we have a type in context, and they uh, uh, denote a space in context. 
Okay, and, and the dependency of morphism assigns to each point its environment. So let's look at some examples. So if I have a simple type, okay, okay, the context is there's nothing in it, it's just the, the single point. Okay, and the and the environment is, is just the empty environment, it's just the, the empty tuple. Okay, so everything gets mapped into that empty tuple. I don't need to keep track of any environments. Okay, let's look at a slightly more dependent one. <clears throat> so if I if I have if I look at the uh, 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 and that's uh, that's actually I think an, an interesting one because let me encode star Borel spaces. So if I have a quasi Borel space A, okay, I can take well take any U in that's a Borel set in it. That's an element of uh, the Borel space uh, of the quasi Borel space B A, and now turn that into a space. Okay, that's what this judgment is telling us. In the context where I have an inhabitant of the Borel space over A. The world started already. I can actually externalize that element into a space. Okay, and when you walk out, what that means? Well, it's going to be a pair of uh, uh, so the elements of that subset. It's going to be that subset together with an element of that subset. Okay, and the environment tells us it recovers the subset that we're talking about. Okay. What I'm not telling you here is what is the random elements uh, 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 of this space. Okay, and that will appear in the exercises. Okay, but the, the points that you get there, these are what they are. Okay, it's an element of you in context. I, the context knows what you is. Any questions on this? Okay, so so. This might look more complicated than simple types, but dependent types are more complicated than simple types. So there's no, uh, I, think, I think we all can agree on that. Yes. I don't really understand what the small a is. So the small a is, so we're looking at the points of u. Okay, so the points of u are elements in u. Okay. But I want to remember which U I have in context. So I'm pairing them with the U that they're with. It's a bit like the growth and construction. We can talk about this offline, but there's a definition. I mean, it's a fine definition to make. It's just a, it's not clear why this is what you want. But, 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 but the point is that if you measure, varies measurably now, right? The environment keeps track of this measurability. That's why I need to keep the U in the environment because U may vary measurably and then A may vary measurably with it. I need to vary together. Okay. Another operation that we need to do to interpret dependent types is contact extension. So if A is a well-formed, uh, um, uh, well from type in context, I can add it to the context, right? And, and this, this, this way of doing semantics means that it's actually doing any, not doing anything. So I have some space that tells me how A is typing context. So I turn that into my context. Okay, you kind of forget the dependency okay, because my type system keeps track of how things depend. That's what the context does. The context keeps track of the dependencies. Okay, and substitutions. <coughs> So I'm allowing my substitution to be arbitrary quasi borel space morphism in the context. Okay. So in the future, once I've done, I'll do a lot of uh, uh, dependent type quasi borel spaces. Maybe I'll restrict myself to only well-behaved substitutions. Right. And once I know exactly which calls I want to have, so I'm just talking to the experts in the room. Right. I might look at a slightly different category where I restrict what substitutions are allowed. But at the moment, okay, I want to still want to explore this universe. I'm, I'm throwing in all possible quasi borel space morphism. As substitutions. Okay. But the non-experts in the room let's loop back and say this is a vast generalization of the things I talked about in the very first and second lecture, where gamma and delta were just numbers counting the numbers of three variables. Now these three variables have types, the types of spaces. And we're considering a very general system of how to write down terms that are correctly typed with respect to all the spaces that the node has in each. If that's a helpful 
that is very helpful, I think. I could not say it, have said it better. Thank you. Okay, so here's one example, and that again, also from James's talk, weakening. Okay, well, as I said here, if I extend the contact with an A, I can uh, 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 weaken it. Uh, 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 going the wrong? Yeah, so the substitution goes in this way, and then its action goes the other way. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'm, hopefully, I'm not marking this up. Uh, um, And it's just a dependency function. <clears throat> so now when I have a substitution on types, so if I have one of those substitution, I can now substitute in types. That's kind of one of the things you do in dependent type system, you substitute all the values in the types. Um, so I have one of those substitutions. I'm missing it, some of the brackets here. And I have a type in context delta. Okay, how am I going to get the, the semantics of a substitution of a by the substitution? Uh, so the construction is a pullback, but you can calculate what it is. It is the environment, so the, the, the current environment I'm in, and then all the elements uh, 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 in here that once you apply uh, the dependency, it lands in that environment. Okay, and again, I'm not describing the random elements here, and that's going to be in the exercises. Okay, so let's look at a concrete example. That's a bit abstract. Okay, if I look at a simple type, okay, uh, uh, um, uh, and I have some uh, uh, element of some type A, so this is what the type would look like in, context, in the context with a, a, a inhabitant. It's going to be a pair of what is in the context and what is in the simple type, suitably weakened. So in this, in this syntax, I'll keep track of those weakening. Okay, if you're working in like in Agda or in, or, uh, uh, in Idris, uh, it automatically kind of gets rid of those weakenings. You don't really see them in the syntax, and there's a whole bunch of technology that lets you insert them correctly. Okay, but here I'm putting them explicitly. Again, when you embed a language in those languages, then as in my lectures, you do have to change. Okay, terms, okay, because this is part of the point. You want to create complicated terms, okay, uh, that denote well formed quasi world space morphisms. So a term in context gamma of type A uh, is a morphism from gamma to type A, but the dependency has to stay the same. It's a section. Okay, so let's look at an example. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, if I look at the term of if I have some real number, I can look at the half close interval from X to infinity. That's a Borel set. Okay, that's a Borel set of this. It's an inhabitant of the Borel, st the Borel sets over R. Okay, and that's going to be an element of this R times Borel of R based on what we did in the previous time, because that's what the weakened space look like, looks like. Okay. A slightly more abstract example, what the variables look like. If I have A in context uh, uh, gamma, you actually you actually have to be a bit careful here because I see even I uh, missed it. There has to be a weaken here. Okay, so so when you use a variable, yeah, the, the the time of the variable has to be weakened for everything that comes after it in the context. Okay, so it's missing here, but it appears here. Okay, uh, uh, um, so I retain the environment. Uh, 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 um, and I use the dependency uh, uh, function for that well type type to get this. Okay, and the exercise is now define the action of substitutions on terms. Yes. I won't say in general, this is one specific interpretation. It's the locally Cartesian closed. No, not always. It's a one way of doing semantics for dependent types based on locally that is in closed categories. There's other ways of doing it that might be a bit more close to the syntax. So, so it's if you just generalize a little bit, it's comprehension categories, um, and if you generalize a bit more, it's categories with attributes. I think, uh, uh, but I'm really not an expert on these kind of models yet. But there's other people in the room who are much more clear than James. 
So, any questions so far? Okay. Does that mean everything is clear? Or does that mean that nothing is clear? Okay. So, so it's a bit more important for me to have slides on this because uh, I've not yet typed the exercises, but there will be exercises on them. Okay, and in this flavor of dependent types, dependent pairs are really not, not doing any work whatsoever because the context keep track of everything. Right? Um, so if I have a, a two, two well top form types in context gamma, A, and B also requires a, an inhabitant of A, then I can take the dependent pair of an A and then a B that depends on that A. Okay, so what's that? That's gonna be <clears throat> the semantics of this type. Okay, but then compose the dependencies because uh, 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 remember elements here carry their environment right so i already know what the first element is going to be here that's what this dependency gives me okay so compose the two dependencies i don't want to do that because i have actual sums later and i don't want to have the same symbols for sums of probability or, or sums of integrals yeah, that, that's why I, I I know what you mean. It, it's it doesn't hit the same mnemonic as the as the straight by does. Uh, but but uh, I need a different symbol. Yes. Yeah, could you explain what's different between upside down type and One operates on types. One operates on like numbers. They're like completely different types. There's a type type mismatch. So, so the semantics of a judgment is a space, a space, the morphism. So we can think of the the type of the dependencies as this triple, but I'm projecting out the top space and the bottom space. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? Yes. So a dependence I can be if you're using Idris or uh, I don't know Agda. Agda doesn't have it built in. You have to define it yourself. Instead of writing this, you would write something like this. A dependent pair of, of A and B. Oh, you're right. Okay, thanks. Ah, it is a typo. Thanks. We'll fix it later. Thank you. Sorry about that. Any more questions? Yeah, context extension also doesn't do much work. Yeah, it's a well formed context. Yeah, I, I like I, I talked about here. So so talk about well formed context and well formed types in context. It's it's again. Yes, 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 exactly. This is how you, you, you show that something is worth it. Yes. No, I did not because I want to leave it open until I explore what kind of dependent types I want to have. That's that's what exactly what this flavor of semantics gives me. I don't have to fix the, the, the collection of context up front. Any object can serve as a context. Any any space can serve as a context. If I yeah every every more as every quasi-world space model can can give me a space in context. 
Yes. On the right, you're defining parallax tangent with A and A. Yeah. So on the left, you have space, and on the right, you have two spaces at the bottom. So how is So I'm taking this space at the top to be the context now. Okay. Yeah. And the dependency is, is tracked here, right? Because in order to form this in my derivation, I need to know in what way A depends on gamma. So it's, it's that information is carried in the derivation. And in fact, you need it because lower down you're using it. To so we, exactly, yeah, that's why I copy it out. Yeah. Okay, there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes, but if you ever implement an elaborator for dependent type language, which is, I think what James tells his students to do like in the first year, or used to do. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes there as well. Uh, uh, dependent types are complicated, uh, um, but very useful. Okay, so that's what dependent pairs. And the last ingredient is, is dependent products or function spaces. Okay, so you might see them like this in, in that graph. Okay, so I have the same moving past I had before. So I have a well formed type A in context gamma and B depends on A and gamma and will form the dependent function space. <clears throat> so what are, the, what are the points? And I'm not telling you what the random elements are. So I need to keep track of the environment. So gamma is an element of the context. Okay, and what is F? F is a, is a quasi world space morphism from the subspace of A elements that, de was de that depends on this gamma zero. Okay, so you so it's a function that takes that as an input and gives you something in the target type as an output. But uh, uh, um, for every uh, uh, for every input, the dependency in the output needs to be the same, the same as the input. So I can't, you know, I can't change the dependency with this function. Okay, and you do need to work out what the random elements are for this, but, but uh, you do and you can, and the, 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 the right ones, and they give you that application is measurable again. Okay, and in fact, they give you the universal property for the dependent product, so the physical structure of the uh, of the correct slice category, the cost slice category. Yeah, it's slice category. Sorry about that. Um, and now, how much time have I got, Philip? 15. 15 minutes. So, so let's take more questions and then we'll see if we should go down to measures and integration or not. Okay, so any more questions? Yes. This is a uh, so you consider simple types, dependent types. What about? I don't know what linear types mean, so I can't, I don't know, but other people do, so. So there are, I mean, there are linear types, but there are other linear types. Yeah. Do you have any feelings for whether any such system could work in this setting or whether it might be meaningful or useful to see that you don't have a particular model of linear types that you like? Um, or more generally, sub types. Yeah, so as a semantic universe, it's very rich. Uh, um, I think for talking about semantics of linear types or, or substructural types, you need to equip yourself with more structure, for example, some kind of a common one and so on, but you can. Uh, um, and so perhaps, but it's not something I'm expert of, so I don't really know how to give you a definite answer. Yes, of course. <laughs> worth exploring and one of my kind of goals with this kind of course and producing this material is that someone who do actually know about these uh, uh, semantic edges could actually go and do that if they want to follow up or do you want to answer okay so an area that you are much more yes so when we talk about measures right we'll define a specific monad uh, 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 over this this category and, and yes we'll, uh, very nicely in fact that's one of the advantages of this approach is that you have a very well defined semantic category like set and then you equip it with extra structure for doing semantic effects you want a follow-up so my follow-up question is 
little bit simpler than that. Which is to say, are there other canonical structures of this category distinct from the one that implies that it works? And couple of that. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a good good one in mind. Um, if you change this to set, what would your, your answer be? So if I ask you back, are there any interesting monodal structures on set that are not the uh, copper like in the product? Say again? I would think about pointed sets if I wanted interesting non-Cartesian. Non but that's not on this category, right? That's on the... So yeah, if you move categories, sure. If you take any strong monad, then uh, you can look at, at the class the category, and that's going to have a monad structure given by the product. But, but that, yeah, so in a sense, we have loads. Okay, but, but I don't know if that's what you're looking for. I'll rewind the question then. When you define the simple product space in class D, you observe that this corresponded to the space around element. So this interesting correlated property. So you might think if you have two other spaces, there are ways of putting them together to get random elements which are not correlated or correlated by a different kind of rule or something. Mm -hmm. And then for those things, do they have a structure? You can do lots of tricks there, right? So you can, forget, for example, take only the sigma simple one. So you can turn them both into measurable spaces and, and then take the product there and go back and see what happens. I don't know if it's going to give you a normal structure. Because, I mean, it should give you a normal structure, but I don't know if how well behaved it's going to be. But there's all kinds of tricks you can do. I, I don't know how to evaluate it uh, beyond it's a one normal structure. Yes, let's go back down to Earth or, or not actually. Uh, how does it, it does not compute. It's in, I mean, how does set compute? Uh, okay. So, so it, it actually it, you can embed you set into it. Second. Oh, purely classical. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very classical. Very, very, very classical. Yeah. yeah. So, so quasi world space because every on every set I can take the free quasi world space over it, the, the discrete one. Right? I have a copy of set living inside it, so it can't be more, more computable than set. You can have fragments of it that are more computable, but, but you can have fragments of set that are computable, but, but you don't get the guarantee that something is computable just by being amorphism in, in quasi world spaces. It really is just about measurability. More questions? Do we to go? Oh, yeah. No. We can go to measure. Do you want me to go back to any previous topic though? If if not, we can go on to measures. Okay. So let's see how much. Okay. So a measure over the real numbers. What's a measure over the real numbers? This goes back to the first lecture. It's a function that assigns to a real world set a non-negative real number, maybe infinity. Such that <clears throat> the empty set gets zero. So if the, the empty set has measure zero, okay, the, the thing to think about is we measure the size of the set somehow inside in a very generalized way. Okay, so the empty set is always size zero. Um, and if I have a, a, a disjoint countable collection of real sets, then their measure is the sum of the individual measures. Okay, we discussed this at the beginning yesterday. Okay, and if you want to get the definition for a measure of a measurable space, you, as usual, replace R with an arbitrary measurable space. Okay. And I'm going to call GV uh, uh, for the set of measures on a measurable space V. And if I want to define the set of measures on a quasi broil space, I can turn it into a measurable space and look at the set of measures then. Okay, and I'm using this flow notation because I'm just finding the points of this because the goal is to be, as usual, to try to turn it into a space. Yeah, so that's what a measure on a quasi world space. It's a measure on its world sets. Yes? measurable space is replaced R with B, which is making a particular subset of R, which defines the image in the um, 
I do not change W. W stays W. Weight stays weights. Oh, but then the R just changes on the on Yeah, yeah, on what measurable set means. Exactly. Yes. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thanks for type checking. It's, it's fantastic. More questions. Okay, and, and this encompasses in, integrals and sums, and this, this is the usual definition, and it also makes sense for quasi broader spaces. Okay, we can turn this now into a quasi broader space okay, by saying what are the random elements from R to G of V? So if for every real number I have a measure, well, <coughs> uh, these are the functions that for every Borel set in V, the function that evaluates that that Borel set is a measurable. Is a quasi world space more, more measurable function from R to them. Okay, so if you know some statistic, it's called means that alpha is a kernel. Okay, so we can actually talk about the space of measures over V. Okay, and, and this is uh, when you do it in measure theory, it's called the, the Giri uh, monad or the Giri space, uh, named after Michelle uh, Giri. She's still around, I think. Uh, I've not, I don't think I've ever met her, but, but she's still around in France, right? I think she's somewhere in France. Um, but actually, this is not going to be the, the, the space we're going to carry around as our space of distributions, but all of them are going to, it's, uh, distribution is going to be a cell space of this. And from this point on, really, we can just forget about measure theory because we have measures. Okay, that's what we want. We want to get measures. So from now on, all spaces are quasi world space. So in the next five minutes, all spaces are quasi world spaces. Okay, and when I say measurable function, I just mean quasi world space opposite because there's no more measurable spaces. Okay, but I had to carry it all the way here to talk about measures. Okay. <clears throat> so what's a simple function? So a simple function on a quasi world from a quasi world space into weights, okay, is one where I can find uh, I can decompose the space into a disjoint collection of world sets. On each of them, I have a constant value. Okay, so just like sigma simple when it's described at the beginning, but I'm replacing the reals with just a, a quasi world space X because I do have a notion of world subsets. In it. If you remember, we talked about sigma simple functions. We said we have to have a, a Borel countable partition. And now we do have a notion of a Borel set of a quasi world space. So we can repeat that definition. So sigma simple means it's a finite, there's a finite a, a partition of a subset of the reals. And uh, uh, sigma finite means for the whole thing. Okay, and we can encode all this the data in a simple function into a space again, kind of having this repeated uh, trick where uh, 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 we have something we describe at the meta level and then we turn it into a space or at least codes for it a uh, space. Okay, so that means a, a, a natural number together with a, a countable equation of Borel sets. Uh, 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 these are the codes, and we take the subspace. Uh, 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 sorry, and, and that describes a, a simple function. Maybe not uniquely, but that's okay. Okay, I can, I'm allowed to repeat the codes. Okay, and the simple codes are now the semantics. Okay, these are all the uh, 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 function f, or the semantics of some code. Okay, and because uh, uh, the semantics is just taking a sum and multiplying uh, indicator functions that's measurable obviously by type but just look at it and it makes sense i don't have to actually check anything okay there's a lambda term here okay it involves sums this is why i wanted to avoid the, the sum type yeah, but i just look at it and it's fine and the exercises establish exactly all the components uh, are, are measurable functions so it is actually just a lambda term based on those components By the way, I could also do this in measure theory. This is not specific to quantum world spaces. So uh, this is, it looks high order, but it's not high order. It, it is just first order. Okay, and one of the first things you prove in, in, in measure theory, and you do the same thing for quasi world spaces, a quasi world space morphism from quasi world, quasi world space X into W is measurable if and only if it is the limit, the pointwise limit of some monotone sequence of simple functions. So we can approximate them from below. Okay, why is that true? Okay, maybe let's go to the intuition first. We have some measurable function from our space X into weights. Okay. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a kind of a given checkpoints to see how far it goes. And we're going to stop after, after a certain point. Okay, and then we'll see, okay, uh, this bit is above this checkpoint, this bit is above this checkpoint, uh, um, uh, this bit, right, uh, doesn't, uh, is only above this checkpoint, but not over the next one. Okay, and then this is going to be the nth approximation of the function from below. And as I squish those checkpoints and make them go higher and higher, I will be closer and closer to the function. Okay. And in fact, not only I can do this in pictures, I can actually do it by calculating a code. And the way in which I calculate a code is measurable because it's just a lambda term. Okay. And now this is properly high order. There is a quasi world space morphism that calculates the simple, the sigma, the simple function approximation of a measurable function. And if I want now to integrate a simple function, I just calculate the measure of each of those uh, uh, sets with the relative weight. Okay. And if I want to calculate the, the, the measure of the function, I take the limit of that. And then you have to prove that it doesn't matter and so on, but these are all standard results in analysis. So it doesn't matter. But well, this is how we define integration of functions into weights, of arbitrary quasi world space morphisms into weights. So let's, let's, let's just do this a bit more uh, carefully. Uh, um, <coughs> given a measure on a quasi world space and a quasi world space morphism connects into weights, I can get a weight to this process. Okay, by taking the limit of all the simple function approximations of it. And you just look at it and it's measurable. Okay, what's not clear that it's unique if I, took, if I somehow took a different way to approximate them, then it, you know, might, might, might get a different notion of it. Well, that's a different proof. But the measurability of this is just by type. I don't have to check anything. Just look at it. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see some sh shakes. Any questions? No. It's like magic, right? Okay. I think I will actually stop here for questions because there's a lot more. But, but I've promised to define integration and measures, and I have done that. But, but, yeah. So. In the exercises, you, you prove that lim taking the limits is measurable and so on. Yeah. So you have to kind of build up the, the, the toolkit of building blocks, but but you just look at each one of them in isolation. You don't have to worry about the composition because you can carry around measurability, the compositional property. More questions. If there are no more questions, we can we can stop earlier for, for, for the uh, for the break. Oh yeah. Oh, in 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 this area. So the reason I started going towards conditional expectation, this is what interests me, uh, uh, is I want to. There's, there's two different things. So once I want to make uh, uh, conditioning as a measurable operation inside your language, in which now I can do that because I have to the. Conditional expectation as a measurable operation, okay, and the things I want to do with it. Uh, uh, but another one is once you have conditional expectation, you can define martingales. You can try to solve. So martingales are a way of specifying um, limiting processes of random variables, uh, which you use for, for like in financial modeling or, or in, in all kinds of fancy modeling. Uh, 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 um, I want to be able to make semantics of these uh, uh, such systems compositionally. That's where I'm heading with this. But that's you know my direction. It's not the only direction in the area. One of the goals of my the course is to give everyone the tool to try to go in their respective directions. So think over this. It's it's a lot of fun. I mean, from my experience. That answer your question. It's a bit. Uh, more, more questions. I think it's about time to break and get coffee, and uh, you can still. Go ahead for more questions.
Thank you.